Well, thank you very much, Janice, and um, thanks for that introduction. And, and also, uh, thank you, along with my fellow organisers, for letting me uh, do this Mycenaean um, seminar. As, as Janis mentioned, I, I first did a, a Mycenaean seminar uh, in 2009 um, about my then just finished um, PhD. And um, then, unfortunately, it took me 13 years to turn that PhD um, into a book, uh, which was finally published uh, last year. And so the book is actually what I'll mainly be talking about today. And I doubt um, many of you remember um, what I was talking about um, uh, 13 or so uh, years ago. But um, uh, just in case you do, rather than give you a rerun of that um, seminar, I'd like to focus on the aspect of my research, which has really developed over time. So the book does still focus on a re-examination of animal depictions in Bronze Age Crete, uh, reading them not as reflections of an interest in the natural world, but rather as an index of human animal relations. But as I was writing the book, and it went through about three different uh, review um, stages, which is partly why it um, took so long, I, I couldn't really avoid the bigger questions in uh, Minoan archaeology, um, such as the development of the palaces, um, and particularly who was in, in charge of them. Um, because really, this is the context in which um, these animal depictions existed, and certain human animal relations, such as hunting and herding, say, seem to change significance over time as they become uh, palatial. But there is another reason why I'd like to address these more social or perhaps political questions today uh, in the light of the thought-provoking book by David Graeber and David Wengro, The Dawn of Everything. Um, for those of you who've read it, their book is a grand comparison of the ways humans organise themselves in groups across time and space. And so Minoan Crete only occupies a few pages. But they do really throw down the gauntlet to Minoan archaeologists. And indeed, I saw a, a talk by Matthew Hasem the other day to the BSA Friends, which also start, uses this as a, a starting point. Um, he, too, he was talking about gender relations, and I'll, I'll touch on that today. So as uh, Graeber and Wengro say, pretty much all of the available evidence from Minoan Crete suggests a system of female political <laughs> rule, effectively a theocracy of some sort governed by a college of priestesses. We might ask why are contemporary researchers so resistant to this conclusion? One, one can't blame everything on the fact that proponents of primitive matriarchy made exaggerated claims back in 1902. Yes, scholars tend to say that cities ruled by colleges of priestesses are unprecedented in the ethnographic or historical record, but by the same logic, one could equally point out that there's no parallel for a kingdom run by men in which all of the visual representations of authority figures are depictions of women something different was clearly happening on Crete. And I, I completely agree that something different was um, happening on Crete. Um, and indeed, a system of female political rule is the most obvious explanation for the iconography of the palaces. But at the same time, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that these women should be defined by religion as priestesses. And so, um, as I said in my book, I, I hadn't actually read uh, Graeber and Wengro at the point this was going through the, the press. Um, but um, certainly in response to discussions of material from Aya Triava, uh, which I'll talk about shortly, and Knossos, um, particularly the temple repositories, I did say that the debate over whether these figures are goddesses or priestesses distracts from the possibility that women's control over domestic textile production gave certain women a leading role in the Knossos palatial collective, um, as it expanded into the areas of Crete where crocuses were gathered and animals hunted. My problem with the idea of um, uh, interpretations of goddesses and priestesses is not uh, because I don't think these figures existed. I think the debate is, problem is problematic partly because it's very difficult to identify these figures in the absence of clear written records, uh, particularly in the uh, proto-palatial and uh, near-palatial period, um, but actually more because these identifications were made by Arthur Evans um, and uh, others um, of a similar time in order really to discount the possibility that women have political power in Bronze Age Crete. Although Evans did uh, toy with the idea of a matriarchy, he ultimately decided that uh, Knossos was um, governed by a male ruler, a priest king, enthralled to a female deity who had mortal female attendants. And ever since this idea of a matriarchy has been bound up with the idea that women had uh, religious power on Crete, including, as you see in, in Graeber and Wengro's reanalysis. 
And um, rather than trying to separate uh, religious and political power, because I think that's probably quite uh, difficult, instead I want to look uh, simply at relationships. And my conclusion will be that women are at the centre of a set of relationships involving textile production and other commodities that also focused on the palaces. By contrast, uh, men seem more connected with cattle herding and other activities such as hunting that defined the territories of these palaces. I want to argue that women were at the centre of what I will call the palatial collective, at least in its early stages, and men organised in a different type of formation defined its boundaries increasingly uh, through violence, which then uh, perhaps spilled over and caused some of the changes um, right at the end of the palatial period. But at a certain point, um, probably um, in the late um, neo-palatial period, um, this male violence led to a reorganisation of the palatial system. And so perhaps at this point, women did lose their political role, although textile production remained central to the functioning of the palaces. My aim is to continue the debate about the social organisation of Minoan Crete, which um, um, has indeed recently been brought into significance by Graeber and Rengro. But I should also say that there's always been a lively debate about this topic, uh, which goes beyond uh, the role of priest kings and priestesses. Um, and I think my particular contribution really is to look at the role of animals in all of this. Um, but at the same time, I think that looking at animals and their relationships to humans um, and how they were depicted over the course of the Bronze Age um, does provide important um, uh, insights into this question of uh, politics. <clears throat> And so the Ayatriada the fresco is an example of why we should ask other questions. Instead of asking uh, who these figures are, are they goddesses or priestesses? Uh, we can ask instead, why is one woman associated with crocuses? Why is the one in the middle wearing elaborate clothing? And what is her relation to these goats and cats? But I think um, there's also a wider point. Uh, the park uh, fresco was uh, preserved by the fire which destroyed the Ayatriada villa in Lake Manoa 1B. But this destruction deposit contains various other objects, including ceilings, which show things like bull leaping and fighting, um, something we also see on the Boxer Riton, which was found with these other relief stone vessels, the so-called harvester vase and the chieftain cup. But there is a tendency, I, I think, in Minoan scholarship to see these objects individually. Um, so, for instance, since there are no other depictions of men with threshing forks at Aya Triada, and indeed no other similar depiction has turned up in over a century of excavating Minoan Crete, I think we should go back to Savignoni's original idea that this is a military procession, because it makes more sense in context of these other depictions. But the question is also how the park fresco relates to these other depictions too. Alongside bull leaping and fighting, there are ceilings showing uh, women and goats, for instance. Um, so all of these um, practices, um, all of these images and the practices that related to them um, clearly coexisted. And the same um, can be said about uh, Knossos. Um, but I'll start with the Grandstand fresco uh, discovered in the first year of excavation uh, by Evans in 1900 and reconstructed from fragments by Emile uh, Giliron the Elder. In the 1900 report, Evans described this as a harem scene with court ladies in elaborate toilette, and he doesn't really identify them um, further. Um, but uh, later he did connect the scene with the idea of matriarchy. Um, as you can see, um, he said that it seems natural to connect it with a matriarchal stage of society, such as is otherwise marked by the dominance of the female divinity. Um, although he sort of gives mixed messages at the same time, he, he reads them as, as kind of gossiping um, court ladies um, rather than um, women in, in a position of uh, power. Um, but I think the prominence of uh, women in colourful textiles in this fresco um, is indeed um, striking. And here I should say that I would identify gender through um, dress um, because I think that the red-white um, distinction um, denotes status, not gender. Um, for reasons that I'll go into um, in a minute. Um, but this is one of the sort of uh, prime examples that um, Wengro and Graeber are thinking about. And it's always provoked debate about why, why these women in such a prominent uh, position uh, with a sea of, of perhaps uh, male faces behind them. Another of the miniature frescoes, the Sacred Grove and Dance, 
Um, Evans also connected with the worship of the mother goddess in her sacred grove. Um, but as um, uh, various scholars have suggested, uh, these scenes appear to be happening um, nearby the palace, uh, perhaps either in the West Court or in the theatrical area with these raised walkways um, here. And so they do seem to depict a real event. And again, women are given prominent positions, both the spectators um, under the tree and also the dancers, again, wearing these colourful textiles. Um, and these, um, room, these uh, frescoes, uh, I should say, appear to have been located in a room of restricted access near the north entrance. So here's the Mark uh, Cameron uh, reconstruction. Um, but Cameron um, um, omits um, the, um, the, the third fresco, which Evans talks about um, in his 1900 report and also in the Palace of Minos. Um, there were a few frescoes uh, found in the same location, the room of the spiral um, cornice, um, but this fresco was never fully reconstructed. Um, but he did publish a, a few fragments. And he saw these fragments as a siege scene um, by analogy with the silver siege uh, right on from Mycenae, which you can also um, see here. Um, so here, um, Evans saw these fragments as recording a historical event, um, seemingly um, outside Knossos. Um, in the 1900 report, he describes uh, serried ranks of youths hurling javelins upwards as if against the defenders of a fenced uh, city. And as you can see here, he repeats um, um, a similar view in the Palace of Minos, that it's a small group of a warlike um, character attacking some uh, fenced uh, city. And um, the uh, fragments um, showing a single male figure, um, and again, I'm going by, by dress here to say this is a male um, figure, um, Evans um, did um, compare with the uh, Chieftain Cup in his discussion um, of the fresco, um, suggesting that this, was a, uh, this person was an officer uh, commanding his men. Um, but in the um, unpublished um, drawing in the Evans um, archive of the, the people with uh, spears or javelins, um, I think that these um, men seem to be in an orderly formation or procession uh, rather than a battle and, and seem to be waving their spears um, instead. And, and it's interesting that Evans didn't choose to, to publish um, this. Um, and indeed, I believe some of the fragments were subsequently destroyed in, in the earthquake that hit Iraqi Museum in the 20s. Um, and the closest analogy to, um, to this scene, if the reconstruction is correct, um, is the harvester bars, where I would argue that the men are also carrying uh, spears in a bundle. I'll come back to that and some of the other aspects of the harvest of ours, but I think the warrior fresco fragments can be read in the same way as the other miniature fresco um, scenes from the same place. Um, that is showing some sort of event close to the palace at uh, Knossos, in which there is a, a military um, aspect, a sort of military procession. And scholars such as Fritz Blackhomer and Matthew Hasem have also drawn attention to the iconography of processions in Minoan Crete and have included the harvester bars, but most people still see them as harvesters, I think. And um, to complete um, the set, the third uh, stone relief vessel from Aya Triada is the Boxer right on, uh, with its scenes of bull leaping and boxing on it. Um, Evans also included this in his discussions of the miniature frescoes because of the similarities uh, with the uh, miniature fresco fragments from Tillisos. Uh, which also show boxing. So you can see here the analogy he makes between one of these fragments or um, two fragments from Telesos and one of these boxes uh, from the box of right on. Um, and indeed, um, since um, uh, we don't know what the people in the grandstand fresco are watching, uh, boxing um, has always been suggested as, as a possibility. The um, Telesos fragments have recently been republished by Yorgos Rathemiotakis. And this does indeed highlight their close resemblance to the Knossos grandstand fresco. Um, but of course, there are other boxing scenes from Knossos, um, a fragment of, of stone writon found um, in the palace, um, and also fragments of relief fresco from the East Wing, which um, seem to show boxing or, or wrestling, um, Evans um, suggested. And as Coulomb uh, pointed out, the priest king um, the, the fragment with the torso is probably also a boxer, which is what Evans thought it was um, originally. And um, the right on fragment with the boxer here was found in the same room as the uh, Toreador uh, frescoes, uh, which, um, so I, I think perhaps you can make the same connection between uh, boxing and bull leaping as you see on the boxer right on. And this really is, is the set of frescoes 
this being the most um, uh, well-preserved one, which really does raise the issue of, of skin colour, which has often loomed large in discussions of the priest king, among others. Um, I, I do think that the costumes of the bull leapers from Knossos show that they're all male. Evans explained the wearing of, of cob pieces um, um, with, with the gender distinction that he, he made of, of white being female, red being male, as a kind of ritual transvesticism, because he saw this as a sport, a, a religious sport in honor of the mother goddess. But instead, um, I, I agree with people like um, Nano Marinatos, um, who suggested that this um, distinction of color could instead be related to age or uh, status. And I think this is important because many recent discussions of gender roles in Bronze Age Crete have concluded that if colour is an unreliable guide to gender, then gender itself is somehow ambiguous or not clearly defined. But I would argue that in these frescoes and, and other um, depictions, there's a clear difference between women associated with colourful textiles um, and dresses, sometimes uh, bare-breasted, and men associated with this type of athletic body and also um, cob pieces. It would make sense that the women on the grandstand fresco have white skin as a marker of high status because their prominent position indicates the same thing. And whereas the miniature frescoes and the slightly larger scale Torridor frescoes were in private spaces, um, perhaps accessed by the kind of people uh, depicted in them, there are various other large scale depictions of uh, bull grappling and bull leaping from uh, Knossos. Uh, these are usually dated to the earlier part of the near palatial period. Maybe the Toreador frescoes are a bit later than, than this, but certainly these were also present um, in the uh, palace at uh, Knossos and uh, more um, visible. Um, the, so these are fragments, again, from uh, the East uh, Wing. Uh, there were also really fragments of women from the same deposit although these don't survive as well. And um, perhaps one parallel is the relief fresco from Syrah of a similar um, date. Um, and I'll come back to the temporal repositories assemblage, um, also early near palatial. But I just want to make the same point that although women are prominent in this assemblage, uh, whether priestesses or goddesses, or maybe just important women, there are also seal impressions in this deposit showing uh, bull leaping and boxing, among other things. Now, um, seal impressions on ceilings are, of course, tiny and difficult to read, but I think they're a guide to the kind of practices and identities being expressed by seal users at Knossos in the earlier part of the Neopalatial period. These are some of the other seal types in the temporal repositories, which also feature what I would see as textile patterns and marine imagery which I will argue um, um, is also related to textiles because um, you have this marine link with purple production, which is a, a marine product, essentially. I'd argue that all of these deposits show that in the neopalatial period, there is an emphasis on women and textiles alongside male athleticism and violence. And in my book, I use uh, Bruno Latour's term uh, collective instead of uh, society because I think that deposits such as the temple repositories are a microcosm of the palace, um, consisting of a variety of different um, humans, animals and things. So as you can see, Latour uses the term um, collective um, to emphasise the operation of gathering or composing, while simultaneously stressing the heterogeneity of the beings thus assembled. So I think it's a slightly broader way to look at um, some of the material culture of Crete. And in the remainder of my talk, I'll be discussing the relations which compose the collective, because I hope I've already shown that single images can't be discussed in isolation to one another. Um, the collective is also something that expands over time as it incorporates new entities. So I would say see the palatial collective as composed of local collectives, um, that is uh, settlements and ultimately households. But I also agree with Jan Driessen and others that the palace can be seen in some respects as a scaled up version um, of the, the household, um, particularly because I think that the association between women and textile production was maintained from household um, through these local collectives to the palace. And I also like the um, term uh, collective because as has been argued for Katrulu Magula, uh, Telsite in, in Thessaly, 
Um, th uh, these tell sites are multi-species monuments uh, composed as much by animal action, such as dung production, which you can see in this micromorphology um, slide, um, as, as human action. So the palace at Knossos, built in the early second millennium uh, BCE, is a continuation really of this multi-species uh, monument, this tell site, which you can see here in its broader landscape. And over the course of the Bronze Age, um, the settlement at Knossos um, expanded, uh, peaking um, in the near palatial period before contracting and, and then expanding again, as you can see from the results of the Knossos um, urban landscape project here. And um, the local and then uh, palatial collective centred on Knossos um, also expanded much more broadly. So these are uh, Todd Whitelaw's um, uh, proposed catchment areas for Knossos and Festos at various uh, periods. But it can also be argued that the territory of Knossos, um, it, uh, through um, other evidence, expanded further, incorporating the whole of the Mesara in the neopalatial period with Ayatriava, um, which you can see here just next to Festos, perhaps becoming an outpost of uh, Knossos. Um, and you can also see Tilosos at the top here, which seems to be within the Knossian um, sphere by the time these miniature frescoes um, were, were made. And I would see the Mesara in the Neopalatial period as, as a place where Knossos was running its uh, cattle. Um, cattle were always an important part of the collective, both for traction, but also as prestige animals. Uh, these are depictions of prize animals from the tombs of the local collectives in the pre-palatial period, but their importance goes back uh, into the earlier neopalatial period. Um, similarly, there's evidence for textile production in these pre-palatial communities with the textile to tools from Myrtos Fornu Kurafi, um, also evidence for, for dyeing, and um, even the goddess here, um, as she's called, who seems to be wearing uh, woven um, textiles. Uh, textile manufacture too um, goes back, uh, like the importance of cattle, um, into the Neolithic. Um, but I think it's certainly possible that woolier sheep arrived in the Bronze Age um, uh, to Crete from the Near East. And so maybe that was one of the stimuli for the uh, textile industry um, to take off. Um, but unlike cattle, um, sheep are very rarely um, depicted um, in, the, in the Bronze Age. Uh, Peter Warren and uh, more recently Brendan Burke um, have suggested that the export of textiles uh, to Egypt could already have been happening in this period, um, given, given the appearance of Egyptian uh, imports on, on Crete in the pre-palatial period and the idea that um, the people of Crete wanted something to trade in return. But really, I, I think there's increasing evidence um, from the past 10 years or so, um, particularly with the site of Alatsamori Pefka in East Crete, um, that the large-scale dyeing of textiles uh, takes off in the proto-palatial um, period, um, and also the crushing of murex shells to make purple dye. Um, this is um, that murex uh, purple is just one of many dyes uh, used at uh, Pefka, um, but um, certainly this shows that this industrial process um, really does date back to the proto-palatial period, and arguably Crete is the place where this process um, is um, invented. <laughs> There's also evidence for textile production at Knossos in the proto-palatial period um, in the loom weight basement. And so the evidence from Pefka and other um, sites with, um, with purple dye processing um, and uh, textile tools and so on in the proto-palatial period uh, means that it can now be argued more convincingly, I think, that the emergence of the palace is, uh, coincides with the invention of purple dyeing and the mass production of, of textiles. The idea that these are centers for textile production and trade from the start has to be considered. And this is an industry that women were closely associated with, and I would argue carried on being closely associated with. Uh, but I want to turn um, to peak sanctuaries now, because in the proto-palatial period, when they um, uh, become prominent, um, they seem to be associated with these local collectives um, because of the, the number of them. Um, and there are a range of different types of human and animal figurines deposited there. So I'll very quickly look at the developments, um, um, well, first at Petsifas, but also at Kofinas, Yuktas and uh, Rissanas, going into the neo-palatial period, because I think these do mark an interesting transition with the emergence of uh, territories, the expansion of, of palatial um, territories. Um, but um, in the proto-palatial period, 
um, given that uh, most of the animals um, de um, deposited at these peak sanctuaries um, and given their number, it seems that these sanctuaries in high places um, in this period simply defined the territories which these animals uh, were raised on. So yes, these are probably um, offerings for the well-being of these animals. And you could look down on the territory of the local collective from this uh, peak sanctuary. And then as Alan Peatfield um, and others um, have suggested, the number of peak sanctuaries shrank in the neo-palatial period. You start to see things like uh, built um, structures as well. And those that remained were more closely related with the palatial um, centers. So what you see um, at uh, Yuktas, um, for instance, here, where you get this um, uh, built structure, is the deposition of more valuable um, figurines, um, both these large clay cattle figurines and also bronze uh, votives, um, including these um, double axes here. Uh, Yuktas is always a little bit of an exception. You could argue that some of the developments that I'm talking about seem to happen slightly earlier at um, Yuktas um, than they do um, elsewhere. Uh, and so this might well be the, the foundation deposit from the late proto palatial period of these uh, votive double axes. Marika uh, Zembekis studied um, the figurines from Yuktas and she compared them with those from Kofanas in the south in the Astorosia Mountains on the edge of the Mesara. Um, so these, um, these larger cattle figurines are also neo-palatial. And Kofanas too um, had a, a built um, structure and it's been suggested that the unprovenanced boxer figurine in the British Museum next door also came from this site because of its similarities with other examples of clay uh, votive uh, boxing gloves uh, found um, in the same uh, site. And at other contemporary neo-palatial um, sanctuaries, um, including Yuktas and also Vrissanas near Rethemnon, there's also evidence for uh, meat eating, um, which seems to mark a departure from proto-palatial practice when it seems to be more focused on the deposition of these smaller animal um, figurines at pig sanctuaries. And then um, the cave at Sea Crow also shows evidence for the same uh, practice of meat eating um, because you have the black layer in the upper cave, uh, which contains uh, these uh, cattle skulls and also um, goat horns, as, as well as this sort of um, this, this ashy um, layer within which they were um, deposited. So um, the double axes at Yuktas were associated with um, one, another of these um, ashy um, layers, which seems to be um, consistent with um, animal butchery and eating. And this is one of the uh, more functional double axes from Sea Crow. And Lowe Fry did suggest that the use wear marks on this axe are consistent with, with butchery uh, for what it's worth. Um, and you can see these more flimsy double axes. I, I, I'm tempted to say that maybe you could still slice meat using them, but actually um, they probably were to do with more of the commemoration of this sort of dividing of the carcass, this, this butchery. From the same layer um, at Sea Crow um, came um, these large scale um, cattle figurines similar to these other neo-palatial um, peak sanctuaries. Um, this is one in the Ashmolean uh, bought by Arthur Evans in the late 19th century. And although these are uh, difficult to date for that reason, um, this clay example does actually come with a record of its fine spot. It, it did come from the ashy um, layer. Uh, which seems to also have contained conical cups. So you, you can sort of build up a case that this is kind of a, um, a palatial, maybe neo-palatial layer. Um, there is also an unusual cup from the Hogarth excavations, which has a depiction of a uh, wild goat on it. And if this is indeed neo-palatial, as is usually suggested, uh, the closest parallel is the, the chalice um, also found at Katosimi, where you also have um, evidence for butchery, large-scale feasting um, and animal heads. And you have this, and you, you have chalices there which resemble um, the chieftain cup. And this was something that um, Robert Cole uh, pointed out. And um, my argument um, is that the evidence from these sanctuary sites points not just to a palatial takeover of uh, these local uh, peak sanctuaries, but an association with particularly male practices, not just because of the boxing figurines at Kofanas but the association with cattle uh, more generally, and also to some extent hunting in the case of wild goats. So I would see these extra urban sanctuaries as gendered spaces in this period. 
um, perhaps not to the exclusion of women. But what I want to show is that men were particularly associated with uh, cattle in the neo-palatial period. And this is something I'll um, do shortly by looking again at some of these relief uh, vessels. Um, but um, remaining on this idea of um, uh, maintaining um, territories, uh, this phenomenon of um, these uh, deposits in these extra urban sanctuaries um, could also be linked uh, with the um, appearance of guardhouses and uh, perhaps even uh, the military roads that Evans was talking about, uh, which date to some point in the, the later proto-palatial period and earlier neo-palatial period. Um, these could have functioned as military strongholds and also hunting lodges, and certainly did continue in use into the neo-palatial period. And so I would argue that the appearance of these um, structures, um, you see examples here in East Crete, uh, mark a transformation of the landscape as territories um, were defined um, and perhaps defended. So these were the territories of the palatial um, collective um, as they, they took over the territories of uh, local collectives as perhaps defined by the earlier peak sanctuaries. And I should also say that I'm um, just going back to Knossos, there's also a space uh, next to the palace, the house of the sacrificed oxen, where you see a very similar thing. You have these cattle skulls um, found deposited in Middle Minoan III um, around the time of the earthquake, which destroyed this uh, building. Um, I think because of um, the evidence from Sea Crow um, and these other sites that this was probably an intact uh, floor deposit, although Evan suggested that cattle heads were deposited there as some sort of expiation ritual after the um, earthquake. But perhaps there is something at Knossos which indicates that these male practices were happening in a building next to the palace um, as well. Um, so what might you ask were men um, doing with cattle other than eating them and keeping their heads as trophies? Well, from around the start of the Neopalatial period um, um, comes this seal stone on the left. It's from a middle Minoan two to three context uh, from Knossos. So unlike most seals, it can, be it can be dated independently of style. And as you can see, it shows a short horned bull with a spear in its back. And you have other neopalatial depictions here of um, cattle, um, perhaps calves, uh, being hunted with arrows, uh, dating um, to the neopalatial period. But the short horn of the bull um, here um, means that it's not an auroch, it's not one of these wild cattle which might well have been roaming around the mainland. Um, and so it's a domestic or feral animal. And it provides evidence, I think, for the, for the hunting of cattle on Crete, uh, most probably in the context of, of raiding. Um, but also, if there was a feral population of cattle on Crete, hunting them might have been easier than catching them. And um, this um, idea of, of cattle hunting, I think, provides a context for the appearance of tortoiseshell ripple cups in Middle Minoan III. Now, both the shape and the decoration um, suggest, to me at least, I don't know if you'll be convinced by this, um, that these are skewermorphs of horn cups, um, which uh, wouldn't survive in the archaeological uh, record. Although Valasia Izakidu um, did publish evidence for horn working from the southwest um, house at Knossos. And I should say that there's no evidence for tortoiseshell uh, processing in this period. Um, so I would suggest that this design um, should be called um, horn ripple, because I would, I, I would argue that these are um, uh, cups made from uh, cattle horns. Now, I've mentioned the um, aurochs, which were maybe roaming around the mainland. Maybe they were indeed um, brought to Crete, um, bred perhaps with the uh, local population of cattle, which is why um, some of the depictions of cattle have these sort of long um, curved uh, horns um, on Crete. Um, and um, this is um, another example of um, a sort of material trace of a society which was interested in um, hunting um, cattle, this time from Scandinavia. And I would argue that the, the size um, and the shape of the Vafio um, cups um, are consistent with a cup made from the top of a horn like this. And of course, they also have this cattle imagery um, on them, which is why the, the tortoiseshell ripple cup um, is also called a, a Vafio cup. Uh, the Vafio cups, of course, are related um, to um, cattle um, capture, um, this one uh, by net rather than um, hunting, um, the one on the top rather, the one on the bottom um, more by sort of trickery tying up a cow to a, a tree. And there's also um, evidence in the form of Cretan seal stones that this capturing of um, cattle by um, net um, also happened on Crete. 
Um, but again, it's these athletic male um, figures who seem to be doing um, the catching. So um, to build up this picture of the association between men and um, uh, cattle and particularly um, the material cult culture related to uh, cattle hunting, I want to return to the Chieftain Cup, which again, um, when it was first published uh, by Parabeni, um, he described this object um, held by the second male figure as a fly whisk, although Evans later described it as a lustral sprinkler, um, which is very evocative. I, I don't know what a lustral um, sprinkler is. Um, but fly whisks in sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, for instance, in the one shown here, um, are often made um, from cattle tails. And these um, collectives in sub-Saharan Africa um, are collectives of humans, but also cattle. Cattle are important constituents of these um, collectives. And um, the reverse of the uh, Chieftain Cup, as um, Forsdyke long ago pointed out, shows figures carrying uh, cattle hides, um, perhaps destined to be made into figure of eight shields, uh, which are shown um, clearly as being made of cattle hides um, in uh, this uh, later fresco uh, from Knossos showing these figure of eight um, shields. Um, but there's also a possibility that leather was being used um, to make uh, clothing. Um, these uh, figures on this ceiling from Aya Triada um, seem to be wearing leather um, skirts. You can see the sort of bulbous uh, nature of them, and perhaps even uh, a leather cloak with this crisscross um, pattern. And the same type of cloak is worn um, by the older male figure on the harvester vase. So perhaps he too is, is wearing a sort of leather cloak. Um, and if you're if you're following me this far, and I'll, I'll be interested to, to um, see what you think of all of this in, in the questions, then I've, I've put up an image on the screen um, of a cane made from a bull penis uh, bone. Now, the, this one is a modern example, but they are attested in Egypt um, as well. So I would ask, is this what the leader of the procession is carrying? If you want to see this as a sort of a, 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 um, a vessel made by a culture, um, a collective of which cattle are central. Um, so you have a close up of it um, here. Um, so you'll have gathered that I don't think these are harvesters. Um, they appear to be wearing um, some sort of uh, leather helmet, uh, which is rarely discussed by uh, those who think that they are. The attachment on the implements that they're carrying is sometimes seen as a hoe uh, for cutting olive branches. But the closest parallel that I can find from Bronze Age Crete is a mace head from a contemporary tomb at uh, Poros. So this would make the bundle on top um, spears, as I've mentioned, which we've already been seen uh, being used to hunt uh, cattle in this uh, period. Um, and of course, um, spears can be used for military um, purposes as well. Hunting is often used as a sort of training uh, for warfare in a variety of different um, collectives. Um, the same uh, tomb in uh, Poros um, contained as well as this mace head, which perhaps is being um, sort of used on a, a um, displayed on a stick in the harvest of ours. It also contained various other things which I've argued are associated with cattle. Um, one of these larger cattle figurines, images of figure of eight shields, a double axe on a seal, and also some of these vafio cups. And rather than seeing this um, as a mace head, I would argue that it um, could also be used as a stunning axe for stunning um, cattle. Um, so two of these are recorded on a Linear B tablet um, from Pylos as part of a, a kit for sacrificing animals. And there is also um, circumstantial um, evidence um, for the use of stunning axes in the form of the rosette design, which sometimes appears on the forehead of bull's head writer. This appears at the exact point where you would hit a bull to stun him before you would slit um, his throat. So this is what stunning axes are used for. If you sacrifice cattle, you would normally um, stun them um, first. Um, so I would see these uh, bull's head writer as simulacra of bull's heads, which as we've seen at Sea Crow, might have been retained and displayed as trophies um, during after the, um, the, the meal um, in which the meat of the animal is uh, consumed. So these writer allow the trophy to be preserved in stone and used further in consumption activities. Um, and indeed, fragments um, of a bull's head right on this one life size uh, were indeed found at the sanctuary at Yuktas. So just a few fragments from the muzzle, um, as you can see um, here on the, the little palace uh, bull's head right on. <clears throat> 
So returning to the boxer item, all of this evidence seems to point to martial training for young men, which also involves uh, leaping over bulls. By this period, if the Messera was indeed under the control of uh, Knossos, then bull leaping would be a demonstration of the skills needed to round up uh, these palatial cattle. I've argued elsewhere that in the near palatial period, there was a ranching system on Crete where cattle uh, were left to run wild and then would be rounded up by hand, uh, clearly a dangerous activity. Um, and in the American West, where they at least had horses to round up uh, cattle, they, they clearly weren't riding horses um, in this period. Um, the same uh, system of ranching uh, led to the rodeo with cowboys showing off their skills. Uh, this was something Evans um, pointed out um, uh, when he was discussing uh, bull leaping um, imagery. Um, but bull leaping imagery does seem to be associated, particularly with Knossos, and it seems likely that this impression of a ring from Ayatriatha um, was made by a seal user at Knossos, uh, given that the same impression and another like it appears at um, sites across the island. And it's been argued um, on the basis of other evidence that Ayatriatha was an outpost of Knossos in this period, uh, partly given the, the lack of activity at the palace at Festos in the earlier part of the neoglacial period. Um, but to return um, to where I started, how does this fit in with the park fresco found in the same building and roughly um, contemporary? There are also ceilings with similar imagery um, to the fresco um, coexisting with these um, uh, ceilings of bull leaping and martial imagery at Ayatriada. And actually, I think that these ceilings might um, uh, suggest a slightly different reconstruction of this uh, fresco from Cameron's, where the goats and the women are perhaps a bit more closely uh, related. Uh, so again, it's worth looking at the wider context in which these images um, exist. But in order to understand uh, these relationships between uh, women and crocuses and uh, cattle um, and goats and, and cats, um, I think it's worth returning to the temple repositories, um, the objects in which were deposited earlier in the neo-palatial period um, and have been published by Paniataki. Um, and Marina Paniataki also dug a few trial pits in the bat room um, next to the temple repositories, um, and she suggests that the bats could be neo-palatial. And I think actually this is further evidence for the, the dying of textiles um, in the palace at uh, Knossos, something Brendan Burke has highlighted in his recent book. So I think the more you look at Knossos, the more you can make a case that this is a textile production um, center, at least earlier in, um, in its lifetime. And so in the temple repositories, you have the same combination of crocuses on the model dresses. Um, you have these elaborately um, dressed uh, women. Um, but you also have imagery of goats alongside um, similar plaques showing cows. Uh, these both depict female animals and their young. Um, so I think there's a claim being made that the fertility of these animals is under the control of those associated with this deposit. And I'm not denying that there could be a religious dimension um, to any of this, but instead want to focus on the relations between people and animals, which constitute the palatial collective. And so see this as a kind of a, a female um, dominated um, sanctuary. Um, but to um, jump ahead to the linear B tablets um, from the time at which this uh, collective uh, finally falls apart with the destruction of the palace at Knossos, it's also clear that goat horns were important commodities in Bronze Age Crete, as this taxation record from Knossos uh, shows. Both Evans and Hogarth, when they saw um, this um, uh, so-called snake frame, um, they did describe it as a composite uh, bow made from uh, goat horns. And uh, so this um, final um, palatial period seal from Knossos seems to show an association between women and these bows. And these were one of the export products of Knossos to the Eastern Mediterranean. So you have composite bows in Tutankhamun's uh, uh, tomb, for instance. Uh, but textiles, I think, were clearly the, the main export product um, right into the end of the uh, palace. Um, and um, it's intriguing, um, going back to textiles, um, that um, the cat's face um, of uh, Cretan hieroglyphic appears to uh, develop into the linear B ideogram for wool. As John Younger suggested, um, this uh, could suggest the use of the loan word uh, malon uh, in great, uh, later Greek meaning uh, wool um, being used actually um, in, um, in Crete um, and being a loan word which was used 
in um, the Cretan hieroglyphic and um, linear A scripts, and then being transferred into uh, linear um, B. Um, and I'd suggest that the hieroglyphic seal and the Ashmolean depicting a cat um, could actually be referring um, to wool because it seems to have um, a, a similar sign between the ears of the cat, perhaps rare if you want to read it um, according to the later linear B syllabary rather than Rue. Um, and the reason I'm uh, bringing this up is because, of course, there is a faience cat in the temple repositories um, to go along with the um, cats in the park fresco, which was wrongly restored, I think everyone agrees, um, on one of the uh, figures' headdresses. Um, and um, since the objects that this votary um, is carrying um, don't look like um, snakes because they have this sort of corkscrew um, twist, um, and since the head wasn't preserved at all, um, I, th I think you can make an argument that the snake frame, i.e. these um, horn bows, um, is a more likely um, headdress uh, for this figure. But again, make of that um, uh, what you will. I think that the coloured um, shells and other marine imagery in the temple repositories um, also indicate that the palatial collective extended over the sea, incorporating this other important source of dye, uh, purple. Um, the goddesses, um, or uh, goddess and votaries after all, um, are wearing um, dyed um, textiles. Which takes us back um, to um, one of the um, other examples of prominent women at Knossos, uh, the ladies in blue fresco, um, probably also near palatial. These uh, women are wearing the major export product of Knossos, uh, dyed uh, textiles with saffron yellow, uh, saffron from crocuses, and blue or purple from murex shells. And so I would argue that a group of women were in control of the palace in this period, perhaps the heads of, of households say, um, because as well as the iconography showing these women in a prominent way, it shows them controlling animals like, um, like goats or being associated with the products of the sea in the case of the temple repositories. So I think what we're seeing here is symbolic ownership of these um, important um, trade goods being gathered uh, in the palace. The linear B um, tablets uh, from Knossos also show women engaged in textile manufacture right up to the point at which the palace was destroyed. But at that point, we do know that there was a male ruler, a Wanax, in control of the palace. And uh, without wanting to get into the um, debate about whether the language of the linear B tablets, Mycenaean Greek, demonstrates that there was an invasion from the mainland, I would point out that in the warrior graves from Knossos, which are sometimes seen as a sign of this invasion, there does seem to be a new expression of a male um, identity uh, with these uh, single burials, often with uh, groups of, of weapons. But in the case of the uh, tomb of the double axes um, at Isopata, um, there's clearly a continuation of some of the castle imagery that I've been tracing in the earlier neopalatial period. Uh, uniquely, the grave shaft itself is in the shape of a double axe, um, and the tomb contained uh, physical uh, double axes, a bull's head right on as well. So I would argue that it, this is the point that a male warrior culture took over Crete, but it also shows that it's rooted in the cattle-focused male practices of the previous period. And this warrior um, identity perhaps continues after the palaces. This is a later Larnax from Armeni showing a cattle hunt with the animals uh, being both speared and netted. And indeed, um, perhaps one of the um, hunters um, carries one of the stunning axes that I mentioned um, earlier. Um, and, but although these are post-palatial Larn axes, they do seem to draw uh, upon and rework palatial iconography. So it's possible that this is looking backwards to the time of the uh, palaces rather than marking a continuation of this identity. And so to conclude, the prominence of women in the visual culture of palatial Crete has always attracted attention, but there's been a tendency since Evans to regard this in terms of religious significance. I've tried instead to focus on the relationships between different parts of the palatial collective and to suggested that there's a set of relationships involving the palaces, women and textile manufacture along of a, alongside a set of relationships involving men, extra urban sanctuaries and cattle. These were two aspects of the same collective and coexisted in the neo-palatial period. But rather than see the palaces of centres of power, I would see them as centres of textile production and trade, 
And from the imagery that we have, this seems to have been under the control of women, both physically and symbolically. The evidence for the mass production of textiles um, coming from East Crete in the proto-palatial period does help show that the palaces could have emerged as centers for the production and export of textiles. The role of men um, was perhaps to maintain the territories of these palatial collectives in which sheep were herded and cattle perhaps left to roam free, and a martial culture developed which involved boxing and bull leaping. But the late Minoan one bee destructions at the end of the neo-palatial period perhaps mark the point at which this martial culture became dominant on Crete, resulting in a new male identity expressed in the Knossos warrior graves. The Knossos palatial collective continued to produce textiles to the end, but the linear B tablets tell us by, that by this time, men were in control of the palace. Thank you.